Welcome to the Badger Podcast. This is Wasabi Boat Research. I'm here talking with Alex Entrepreneur, who's a developer at Badger. Alex, what's going on? Thank you for having me, Wasabi. So we were ch just chatting before we started recording, and uh, you were you were spitting some fire. You kind of said some some things that that made my um made my attention perk up. I guess before we get, get to that, like we're talking about today, what is the path to, to going from a regular schmuck like me, who is a non technical user of um, Ethereum apps, Web three point yield farming, this kind of stuff to actually becoming a technical contributor to a protocol like Badger or uh, Uniswap or Compound or Yearn or any of the other hundreds of, of projects that are out there. And you were basically making the case to me that anyone can do this. So that is kind of like what I, I really want to dig in today and go from like, get sell me sell me on this point. Like, how, what does it take to really become a technical contributor to one of these protocols? And what are the immediate next steps um, that someone can take to to get on this path? And then, what are the actual uh, you know dozens of opportunities that are opened up on the other side of this? And and how long does it take? So all of this is is really super exciting because it's something that I've been thinking about more and more, and um, wanting to get deeper into the tech side of of crypto and and um, part of my journey from just becoming a user to becoming a contributor at Badger. So I think. There's probably a lot of other people who are in in this same kind of situation. So, um, if that's if this is you who are listening, I think buckle up because this is going to be a really uh, really exciting episode. Yeah, and I have to agree that um, our target audience for this chat is are people that uh, uh, already use uh, Ethereum or use the side chains. Uh, they have an understanding of. Uh, or at least an intuitive understanding of how a uh, blockchain works, and uh, you know, the, the having to use a, a, a transaction a block explorer, having to use a, a wallet, a hot wallet, and stuff like that. And then, uh, our, my goal is basically show a, kind of a path as to how you can actually become a developer. So, uh, in uh, in saying that, uh, the the biggest thing uh, uh, to say that, uh, like in making the argument that, that anybody can do it, uh, I really have to believe that, uh, uh, like I genuinely believe that anybody can learn to code or anybody can can develop for uh, for, Sol for Solidity or for Ethereum. Uh, I'm not going to say it's easy. It is not. It's a very difficult challenge. Uh, but I know you can do it as in uh, it, it's basically just a matter of uh, if you're able uh, or, uh, or willing to uh, put in the time and the effort uh, that is required. Uh, so my biggest example uh, is actually um, calculus. Like um, I think calculus is basically the, the most difficult exam on, uh, on earth. I think it's the one that most people can't pass. Uh, and it's not because it's really that difficult. Uh, it's just because you can't cheat. Uh, you can't cheat in calculus because if you can't prove your work, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, prove that you're able. Uh, you're just going to get a zero even if you get the right result because you got to be able to prove your work. Uh, and you can't prove your work if you didn't put in the reps. So it's the same as being uh, building a natural physique uh, to build a developer mind. Uh, you just got to go through the reps. And so my goal is to show the reps in this conversation. And if you want to follow those, I have no doubts in my mind that you can achieve a, a very reasonable goal of uh, being able to develop. And... Um... I don't know, looking at my portfolio, some of my uh, my altcoins are down 60, 70, 80 percent. So if we're heading in a bear market, time to time to be in it for the tech, baby. Let's go. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you don't have a choice. You may as well just uh, be in for the tech uh, and uh, enjoy the ride. Uh, and yeah, to say for my privileged access, um, I keep getting offers every day. So I, I know there's a, the price action is very negative, but ultimately, um, Every person, uh, like the, the, the mind share of this space is growing. It's not reducing. People are thinking about this. They want to understand it. They want to use it. So I think demand is growing while uh, so fundamental demand is growing while price action is going out of the blue. And uh, you may as well enjoy uh, the ride. Yeah. I mean, joke about a bear market, but like my conviction of this space is as high as it's ever been. I mean, every day on Twitter, you see another you know, billion dollar fund being raised to develop web apps. You look at the DeFi pulse chart of uh, TBL and DeFi 
at a time frame more than like 30 days and it's just going, you know, parabolic. You look at um, all the stuff that's being built. You look into discords and see hundreds of people working together to build stuff. Like I just, I just don't see, you know, once you get over the fact that, you know, your altcoins can go down a little bit, you know, this day or that day, like there's nothing to, to make me for a second kind of like long-term bearish on the space. Yeah, and I keep thinking about um, uh, like the one thing I'm not going to be able to build and hopefully some of you listeners will. Um, uh, and one day we should do like a podcast on World of Warcraft because I feel like a lot of people uh, that are in Web3 used to play MMORPGs in general. Maybe it's uh, Minecraft, uh, Rune, uh, what is it, RuneScape or uh, World of Warcraft. But like uh, there's an event in World of Warcraft where you have to unlock uh, a raid um, and uh, to do that, you have to do like 40 quests in a row. It's called the Scarab Lord quest uh, chain. Go, go and read it up. It's basically like the top one out of 10,000 people. You basically need to have 30 people work for you to achieve that. Uh, and uh, when you open the gates, there's like a thousand different enemies that spawn out and they kill everybody. It's like awesome. The entire map is basically death and you have to fight these giant demons and stuff. It's really, really cool. It's like one of the coolest experiences you can ever have on a, a shared online metaverse, I guess. Um, and the server will crash, right? The server will break because ultimately a server is just a function of machines. Uh, they're listening to stuff. Uh, so my, my thought is that uh, um, Ethereum would actually allow to have the only RPG that can't go offline and that can be played by like a, a billion people, like something ridiculous. So you could actually have, you know, the, the Onyxia fight, which is a, used to be a 40 people raid and it, 40 people is a lot, but you could actually have the 1000 Onyxia fight on Ethereum uh, because you're not limited by server because servers are everywhere. They're distributed. And so um, we really are just scratching the surface as to what can be built uh, trustlessly and in a decentralized way. And uh, 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 if you're interested in this type of puzzles, uh, we got uh, more coming. And so it's, it is an ex extremely exciting space. Um, and so I just recommend you uh, don't quit. Just uh, try and stick around and uh, see if they can uh, tickle your fancy. So the first part of our conversation, I think we're just going to quickly talk about like, what are the benefits of becoming a Web3 developer, right? Like, you're here, you're in this space, maybe you're using Badger, maybe you're using some other apps uh, in DeFi. But what what are the um, kind of, like, intellectual, financial, uh, political, ideological benefits? So, like, I don't know, like, if you, if you could just start, like, what, what are some of, like, the coolest problems that are being worked on right now in, in DeFi, in Web3? Like, what, what are the... Um, what is kind of like the technical mm. cutting edge of of, um, of 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 the work that you're doing or that you see other teams working on right now? Amazing. I love this question. I would say the first step is actually to really appreciate uh, uh, what uh, was solved. And uh, in doing that, we can go back to the, the Satoshi white paper, uh, which ultimately, like if you, if you go and look at the history of how uh, Bitcoin uh, came up to be and uh, this space was uh, basically founded, um, you have to realize that uh, Bitcoin wasn't invented uh, out of nowhere. Like Bitcoin was not the first uh, uh, digital money, as in, uh, you know, bits uh, that represent uh, a balance in your account. You had PayPal, you had, um, was it uh, Bitgold, I think, by, um, I think it was Bitgold or uh, uh, Bitcash. But basically you had alternative uh, uh, solutions. The issue... Uh, that uh, uh, Satoshi solved through uh, the uh, what what is now uh, came to known as the Byzantine fault tolerant consensus is um, is the fact that you could not double spend. So that was the first uh, problem that was solved, and that literally created this space. It's the double spend problem. Is the fact that if you are uh, like on LimeWire, right? You are like on a torrent site. How do you prove? that a person can only download the torrent once, right? Because there's other peers, there's other people. So some of them may already send the, the file. Some pieces may have already been gone twice, et cetera. And so uh, if you look at it that way, uh, that's the first thing that, uh, that, uh, the, that like nerds were trying to solve was the double spend problem. And in solving that, uh, they basically created digital scarcity. Like Satoshi invented digital scarcity 
by solving the uh, uh, the solving the double spend issue. And by to solve the double spend problem, he had to solve what is called the Byzantine general problem, which is how do you coordinate different agents that may not trust each other. That's fundamentally the the, the core issue that was solved, uh, and the way to solve it was proof of work. So. Proof of work was an incredible achievement, and you can still argue that it is, uh, because uh, it solved uh, these uh, very uh, difficult uh, problems in computer science. And uh, on top of that, the uh, genius solution of Bitcoin uh, uh, was to make it money or a competitor to money, although we can call it you know, digital property now. Uh, but ultimately, in giving it an economical value, uh, this entire system that is based on not trusting each other that is based on uh, people being adver- adversarial, people actually challenging uh, the, the chain, challenging proofs, challenging everything. Uh, it ultimately cre- created a sort of incentives that uh, forces people to coordinate, not because they necessarily want, but because it's in their best interest. So uh, I guess uh, we did find uh, the, the, the only unlimited resource on earth, which is human greed, mm. and uh, we used it to build something amazing. We used it to actually build something that uh, uh, literally created a new uh, a new asset class and it created a new space uh, uh, to to be explored. And so once once you can fully appreciate the you know the power of the this artifact called the white paper Satoshi's white paper, um, once uh, once that's uh, at least uh, once you have an intuition for that, we can start to talk about what happened after. Uh, which is Ethereum and the idea of having a decentralized virtual machine uh, that nobody can touch, nobody can see, uh, but we can all agree exists in the ether, in the in uh, in uh, you know in our in our uh, shared uh, meta space uh, or shared byte space uh, or shared virtual space. So let's get into that a little deeper. Here, maybe I want to ask the question a little bit differently. So. Let's let's go let's go this way. So Alex, I'm going to give you a um, billion dollar uh, VC fund today, and you know you see these funds being raised every day on Twitter, like you know a Web three VC fund. What mm-hmm. are the startups that you're looking to to fund? Like, what are the kind of problems that you would like to go see teams build right now today? Wow. Okay. So I generally never thought of that. Um, if I had a billion dollars, what would I be doing in in this space? I feel like I'm, I'm kind of a. Uh, I feel like I, if I had uh, infinite resources, I would just work on it. If true, to be honest, I would just work on uh, getting the um, the merge to work and getting uh, proof of stake to actually be as uh, uh, reliable as uh, um, proof of work, because I feel like that's uh, uh, basically the bottleneck. And then the step after would be to to do further research into uh, 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 into uh, rollups and uh, uh, layer shoes uh, to enable scalability. Uh, I also feel like uh, the the entire um, wallet space is a complete joke. I would put hundreds of millions of dollars in creating competing wallets. I, I guess I will put a lot of money in competing RPCs as well. I feel like all of these layers of just enabling interaction are not uh, explored at all. Uh, I guess the other thing is uh, a um, self-hosted block explorer. I don't think there is an easy op- option for that. You have to basically run your own node. So that sounds to me like uh, uh, something that uh, um, is completely missing. So uh, more so than solving problems, I would just solve the underlying uh, access because I feel like there is no not enough access at this point. If MetaMask flips a switch, uh, we can't even get Ethereum. If, if Etherscan goes down, we can't see Ethereum. So I feel like that's what uh, uh, I would start with. And then in terms of uh, my interests, uh, which is something that is easier for me to talk about, I feel like uh, um, uh, actually building uh, um, self-sustaining flywheels or self-sustaining uh, um, uh, yield farming strategies that don't require governance. That's kind of the the challenge that I see is the ability to remove um, to remove uh, uh, any form of uh, uh, external intervention and just letting the code run. I feel like that's what the next step is in terms of yield farming. Uh, the other thing will be um, uh, 
hedge strategies, but uh, we're, we're going to get them this year. So uh, it's more about removing uh, any middleman in, uh, in yield. That's one. And then uh, it's just uh, about scaling the technology and uh, uh, making more people use it. Uh, and then uh, the rest of the usages are more recreational. Uh, I feel like uh, the coolest thing we could do is actually build a uh, actual MMORPG on, uh, on Ethereum. And I feel like that's uh, massively underappreciated. Uh, most uh, developers use NFTs to make quick uh, money, but they really fail to understand uh, the actual uh, value of uh, uh, you know making one. Uh, again, I'll use the World of Warcraft example, but like you know, you have um, the what's it called, the Blade of Azinov, like the legendary weapons from Illidan. It's like the last boss. It's basically the coolest weapon in the game. But like um, uh, anybody can have them because it's just a, a reference to a database. But what if you created like the sword of a thousand truths, which is like a South Park meme, uh, and there was actually only one, right? And you can get it in game. And then uh, you maybe you build a game where you die, and if you die, you can't come back because it's like a roguelike on Ethereum. And so now if you start thinking about that, maybe you build like an ecology where trees can grow and there's actual real trees and there are limited resource and they're provably limited and you and you actually try and build something like that um i feel like i feel like it's really a, there's a, like every aspect of it is completely un, underexplored and underinvested um it's just i feel like it's more about personal uh, hobbies i don't see it uh, um necessarily uh, you know having a, a, a like and that that's what i feel like it is the the opportunity for me at least is like it's it's more about what you want to build than uh any specific uh, uh uh problem you may be solving in general i feel like it's it's more about the, the puzzles and um uh, uh the the cool uh uses that this this technology can have uh that are uh, completely underexplored yeah okay so there's a whole universe of stuff. I have my own ideas. Maybe we can talk about this on another podcast, but like there's a second bucket that I think brought, brings a lot of people to crypto. And that's kind of like this political ideological bucket. I don't know if you saw, if you follow this guy, uh, DHH, the uh, founder of uh, 37 Signals, he had a blog post out um, and he had been this long time, you know, Bitcoin and crypto skeptic bear and the trigger for him to completely flip on this or mostly flip was this uh, Canadian trucker protest situation where he saw, you know, governments turning off the payment uh, or uh, bank accounts for, for these protesters and um, really just saw that, you know, the possibility for crypto and, and DeFi to be this like check on government power, even if it's not perfect, but like this other kind of escape valve for, for governments, like, I don't know. Do you, do you think that... Yeah, I um, think it is deeply... Our space is deeply entrenched in political and economical uh, scenarios. Uh, the the first time-stamped uh, message on Bitcoin is literally the bailout of banks. That's not even a hyperbole. It's literally what uh, Satoshi put. I think... Uh, um, I feel like as a generation, like uh, um, we, we are not as... Uh, um, I guess willing to die for our ideals, as uh, uh, some books may portray uh, previous generations. Uh, but I also feel like we are a heavily politicized uh, generation, and uh, the tools we have uh, lead us to uh, great extremes. I think uh, um, if uh, uh, an atomic uh, fallout were to happen, um, Bitcoin would basically be the only way of money that will be maintainable. There will be people building uh, SHA-256 uh, uh, <laughs> abacuses, literally pieces of wood that calculate uh, your ash for you. And those will be called oracles, people called oracles. I literally see it vividly in my mind. Because every other currency was, uh, you know, they literally would just take a knife, cut out a little bit of gold a little bit each time, and they will debase it that way. That's how most currencies before uh, the the latest 300 years were debased. They literally were just cut out and get the extra pieces of uh, material out of it. Uh, uh, so I feel like uh, um, it is, um, uh, but I ultimately um, don't have as strong of an opinion on, on a political level. I feel like uh, 
uh, decentralization, and that's not even my quote, but decentralization matters when uh, when it when it's the only thing you got. And so I I believe in that, and I'm glad that we can offer that. Uh, but uh, that also comes with the bad. The downside is uh, um, uh, it it is factually a, a wild west where you can uh, you know you think you're giving a donation to a cause you believe in, and then it turns out it's just a scam. So uh, uh, the the true sides of the, the the good comes with the bad, uh, and um, I genuinely feel like the best thing uh, we could do for this space is to um, make it a little harder maybe to access because maybe you need to be a developer to use it. Uh, but then just not have any regulation because in in lack of regulation, we can have a lot of creativity. So I feel like uh, uh, the political argument is uh, real. It comes uh, uh, into play, especially when you deal with, uh, uh, you know, closing banks and stuff like that. So it basically retorts to Bitcoin. But I don't think most people will die for Ethereum today. You know, I don't think most, I think most people will keep working on it secretly. But I don't think most people will die for Bitcoin. But I do. Uh, sorry for Ethereum. But I feel like some people will die for uh, for their access to Bitcoin and uh, uh, their ability to have money. So I think we're uh, we're not there yet uh, uh, for, for the the whole space. Uh, just like you wouldn't die, you know, for the internet. You're just gonna get annoyed and send like a complaint letter and change your ESP provider. Um, so. Um, yeah, um, I think there is a very strong political argument, but that it's definitely not what um, the reason why I'm uh, in this space. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking personally. So I live uh, in Washington, D.C., and I've been thinking very hard about the fact that, okay, I think, you know, given what's going on with Ukraine, Russia, World War Three possibilities, like, um, I don't know, at least for me, like living in a superpower is not a benefit. It's kind of a liability. And I'm thinking about ways to... Uh, do we need, you know, do I need to renew my passport? Do I need to get an, a plan B if the shit really goes down? And, you know, I'm just more and more thankful that I, I work now in this space that is truly global, getting paid by a smart contract, getting um, payment in a, in a way that is totally crypto native that, you know, if, if something really did happen, like that would basically be our, our lifeline for, for me and my family. So, you know, there's not, not just like that, am I willing to die, but is this way, you know, a way to have other options in my life? Right. Yeah. Can I live from it? Yeah. I think that's, uh, that definitely is an underappreciated side. Uh, and, uh, I can give you like a real example of, uh, doing that, uh, in my life. Um, uh, um, I mean, I don't. I don't know if it's like a. It's a, it's a pretty dumb problem that I had, but like I was uh, traveling, and uh, in traveling, uh, uh, if you change your mind too much and you order like an Airbnb and then you change and whatever, uh, some some um, like the card it takes like a day or two to get your money back, and so what what would happen to me is my cards will always get blocked and I would basically be unable to use any money in a, a random foreign country. Like I can't withdraw. I basically have nothing. Like I'm just whatever I got on me is what I got, you know, you got to figure it out. And so uh, I used uh, some of these uh, coupon sites uh, to like buy uh, whatever, like uh, Uber Eats and stuff like that, uh, because it was literally the only way to uh, to, 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 to eat uh, that night, uh, um, unless, you know, I, I guess I could bag. Uh, uh, so, so I feel like that's um, uh, something that is actually achievable. Like you can live with this technology today in most parts of the world uh, and uh, um, and have a very, uh, you know, autonomous life uh, on that end uh, because the infrastructure for, for that use case is, is, is fairly well developed, actually. All right. So we talked about the cool problems. We talked about political ideology. I think, you know, money, obviously, like, I don't know if we need to spend much time on it. You're saying you're getting offers every day as a Solidity dev. Like, I don't doubt that. You see, if you look on Twitter, you see every day there are these. I would say that uh, as a, like a nerd, uh, the, the beauty of the money thing is uh, maybe you studied computer science. Uh, maybe you studied even statistics and you were like, uh, this stuff is useless. Uh, it is not. It actually is uh, the closest thing to superpowers is being able to use math and you'd be surprised. But then the other side is like uh, studying the economy uh, or being exposed to the economy through this space uh, is a great way to uh, really round, round out your knowledge uh, because you uh, uh, the beauty of uh, uh, financial markets is that you can have any opinion 
and you can test it. And that's something that is extremely underappreciated, uh, in my opinion, because, you know, in science, everything you do is tested. Um, and you would like, you would be mad if you don't have a certain degree of accuracy. Uh, so I feel like, uh, what, uh, the, the, the stock market or in this case, crypto offers is that, uh, ability that you can test any hypothesis. Um, uh, and, uh, that, that's great, uh, for, for, uh, you know, if you're like a, just a creative person or like a person that tries to really figure out how things actually work, um, you actually, uh, get feedback from everything you do here. So it's a, it's an amazing place uh, to, to learn and grow in terms of uh, your knowledge. And, uh, you know, like the, the number in your bank account or your, in your wallet can grow, uh, but ultimately uh, it's basically also your sense of agency that grows with it because uh, you were, uh, you found uh, like the trick or you found uh, something that actually works in the real world. All right. So if you're on board with the cool problems, ideology, the, the money stuff, the autonomy, the testing, um, and you want to jump into this, we're going to transition now to part B of the conversation where we talk about the specific technologies and steps that you can go through. So I don't know, do you want to like set us up with the kind of two tracks? I don't know, like there's basically like the front end track, which is kind of making the um, APIs and user websites and um, the things that go from a user to sending the transactions to the blockchain. And then there's the back end, which is the actual solidity code that's run in the ethereum network that executes the transaction um and those are basically like the kind of two buckets for for developers right like how does that how does that yeah shake i'd out? say that uh, uh it is um it's basically a, a true uh, like you can look at it as two paths i feel like those two paths need to meet if you want to uh, really round up uh, your knowledge and you are missing out if you don't try both uh, both sides, if you don't try both the front end and the back end. But ultimately, the front end uh, is more of a uh, salesy, marketing focused uh, aspect of it. The front end will help you launch your company. That's my experience as a consultant and startup, uh, whatever, startup guru or whatever it is, working with a lot of startups. If your presentation sucks, you're going to make no money and you're not going to live. So the front end is one of the most important aspects of actually getting stuff to move off the ground. It's basically like your presentation is as important as the substance. And then the solidity side is the substance, is the hard problems, is the uh, actual uh, beauty of uh, solving puzzles. Uh, so uh, uh, the front end offers you gratification through people recognizing your uh, ability because you make it easy for them to use it. And uh, the uh, Solidity side offered you uh, gratification through solving uh, really complex problems and uh, um, making your small contribution to the space. All right. So let's start with the front end stuff. Um, what, I don't know, what would you say is like the prerequisite? Like if someone has a zero programming ability or someone who's already a developer, like what are, what are, are there, is there a different path you would recommend for those two people or? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I'd recommend, uh, I mean, I'd recommend you learn JavaScript to start, uh, because JavaScript is how you build website at this point. We can, you know, there's no point in being, uh, nuanced about it. Just learn JavaScript and then complain about how JavaScript is bad. It doesn't matter. Just learn JavaScript. And uh, in learning JavaScript, it may be a great idea to learn some basics of computer science. Uh, I can recommend CS50, CS50 on YouTube uh, or Google it. CS50 is uh, from um, Harvard, I believe. And it's uh, uh, basically the best university course uh, on earth by far, bar none. I uh, had to basically not study a couple exams because I studied uh, CS50 back uh, when I was doing university. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's an amazing introduction to all the facets of computer science from dealing to the, with the stack of how, me or how memory works to dealing with, uh, you know, uh, b uh, binary algebra, uh, or Boolean algebra and, um, um, some languages such as C, Python, and I think even JavaScript. So if you've never coded in your life, go take CS50 and then build websites. Well, if you already uh, know how to build websites, you can just uh, skip ahead and just learn um, about integrating with um, uh, the more web-free stuff. All right. And CS50 is like one of those uh, MOOCs, right? Like it's a free course that anyone can watch the videos and do the assignments, right? 
Yeah, I think uh, it is. And uh, uh, it's uh, by Googling, you find it on edX. Personally, I just followed it on YouTube. Uh, you just watch the lectures and take notes. Uh, and uh, then there's like some uh, shorter videos, which I think are for the assignments, where they go over, you know, how algorithm works, uh, like quick sort, merge sort, etc. cetera, uh, which, you know, you may never use, but it's still uh, intellectually stimulating. And so uh, it, it's really interesting. And uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, um, like my, my take on university in two seconds is uh, you don't need it for the first five years because for the first five years, you basically are useless as a programmer. But after that, you, you basically, that ends up paying dividends because uh, you know a lot of stuff that uh, you wouldn't even have think, thought about. What about someone? I, so I built a bunch of websites in WordPress and I, I was looking around for WordPress. I know that's PHP. So like WordPress, Ethereum uh, integrations, like, do, is there any path there? Have you ever played with, with things like that, that are kind of like modular? Funny enough, I did. Oh, man. That, that brings back memories. Uh, but by the way, do you write PHP or was it just the template stuff where you just use the, the, the WordPress backend, the PHP, WP-admin? Yeah, no, no, no. I just blank themes, plugins, this kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, but did you code the plugin or did you just install the plugin? No, no, sir. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so basically that's uh, how I, I got uh, into uh, development. And I think uh, even uh, the founder of uh, My Ether Wallet, she did the same path. I think it's a very common path for web development is you, uh, uh, WordPress used to be insanely dominant. And then uh, perhaps some people ask you, you know, to change the color of a bar or something. And then you start learning CSS uh, by injecting in the custom theme, something that at this point is super trivial to me, but it may sound really complicated uh, when you first start out. Uh, and then maybe you can be, you learn, teach yourself how to build a theme, stuff like that. You, with WordPress, you learn the loop, uh, you learn uh, get template part. Uh, then you learn how to integrate with plugins. Uh, there's a famous plugin called BuddyPress that allows you to build uh, social media, uh, social networks. There's literally one company on earth that can code the BuddyPress and I'm basically the other company that can do it. Uh, it's, uh, mm -hmm. It used to be like super niche. Uh, but yeah, you cooled and uh, uh, I would advise against. I literally got, uh, maybe I made like $2,000 consulting uh, a random uh, web free startup that decided to use WordPress as their front end to connect and do like some staking. And I spent basically half of the time telling them how that was the dumbest idea I've ever seen. They should have just rewrite it in React. Uh, so if you're looking to be at the cutting edge, which is Ethereum is at the cutting edge of technology, you can criticize it, whatever, still at the cutting edge, just use the cutting edge tools such as React. Don't waste a second uh, using uh, WordPress, not because it's bad, but because you're basically uh, swimming on your own when you could have had a team of people that already built all the tools for you. So uh, you're just going to uh, really make it more complicated than it needs to be. If I can get uh, started with just a quick chat about how, how you would get started as a Web2 developer is you pick a framework, Svelte is fine, Vue is fine, React is ideal because React has the most uh, NPM packages you can already use. So you pick one of those. If you don't know what I'm saying at this point, that's the first thing you got to learn. And I actually have videos about getting started with React. But basically, just build your little React application. And then the step after is you got to learn how to integrate with Web3, where Web3 is a combination of a, a JavaScript library. One of them is called Web3. The other one is called Ethers. Ethers is the one you want to use, Ethers.js. And uh, Ethers will allow you to uh, connect to a injected provider and this is a keyword injected provider means uh basically metamask is a uh, wallet that gives you access to a rpc url or rpc is just a for our intents and purposes just a url it's the uh, url that you get at infura you just go to infura.com pay ten dollars and you get the rpc url and then that rpc url allows ethers to talk to ethereum and the reason why it can talk is because the RPC that we call RPC is just a URL that allows you to talk to an Ethereum node, all right? So to, in order to build a website that talks to Ethereum, you need to find a way to talk to an Ethereum node so that you can query the Ethereum blockchain. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, it does. So React is the framework for actually building the websites. Like you can build any web app using React and then... 
Yeah, some people are cringing now. React is a library, uh, but yeah, the, it's basically the tool you will build. Now, I, I think I said framework too. It's uh, it's my bad. Uh, but basically, you will use something like Next.js, which I highly recommend. You use Next.js because it has uh, some nice feature that allows you to uh, develop uh, easily. Using React, which is the library that allows you to populate uh, websites uh, with content. And then you learn this extra library, which is called Ethers. And with Ethers, you can communicate with the Ethereum chain. So you is Web3.js or Ethers, but and you prefer Ethers. So like those are the two kind of competitors in this. Uh... Yeah, I would say there's uh, there used to be competition. At this point, Ethers is the de facto uh, standard. Picking up Web3 is a sign of uh, masochism. It's okay, you can do it. But ultimately, Ethers won by a long shot. Uh, and so at this time, Ethers is the, the library I'd recommend. And then Web3 is the one you fall back on uh, uh, if you have to. Let me let me ask you this. So I guess, what are we, what what is Badger currently using? And what are the sort of like problems in this space? I guess you said like, it's all the Web2 side. It's all about like usability and making it look good and making it... Um, selling you know selling the use of the of the actual application right so is, would you say that that's kind of like the real tricky problems now is like making it simpler taking this complex uh operation and making it one click and easy for for the user or or is it something else yeah i'd say so so i'd say that's uh, really the the main um, um challenge is in uh, just making uh, the pro the product the website uh, look great load fast uh, give you all the information and so we can go into details about that. And I'd, honestly, I'd be happy to. Maybe we can do that uh, in a separate podcast with Jintao as well, where we can talk about all the tricks to optimize load on a front end uh, and this kind of stuff. Uh, but for the intents and purposes of uh, this uh, lighter conversation, uh, you ultimately just want to make it uh, uh, easy for people to unlock their wallet, connect to the contracts for their wallet, and operate uh, with contracts. And so the biggest breakthrough that you learn when dealing with Ethers is uh, what is a contract. So for us, a contract is like uh, some code. Uh, it's hard to define what a contract is at this point. But for Ethers, a contract is simply the combination of the address where it's located. So you need to know the address. And then it's ABI, where ABI is a JSON uh, object that allows you to know which functions are in the contract and what return values those functions have. So when you, once you get started with Eaters and you understand that, and you understand how to basically set up a contract and talk to it, uh, everything else is mostly about um, uh, presentation and uh, getting stuff to load fast. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is minimizing RPC calls, which is the idea that every time you need to get one data, one piece of data, you will just uh, you know ask for that single piece instead of bulking requests, and bulking requests will make it easier instead of again doing one at a time, and it also makes it more expensive because uh, these RPC requests have a price as well, and so um, uh, those are the kind of challenges in the front end. It's ultimately about uh, presentation and uh, um, quality of the interaction. Got it. So if you're interested in the front end, you want to learn basically computer science. Uh, basics and then a uh, react and then ethers right i'd say that's a really great starting point uh funny enough if you go and uh, google my github uh, github at gallo das ballo the most uh, difficult name ever uh but basically there there are a bunch of uh, starting templates uh, uh written in next.js uh, they already work with uh, uh hard at and i guess the last piece that we haven't mentioned is the graph the graph uh is basically and i know grt is like one of the you know, uh, non-performing tokens, but the graph, the technology is as is basically a lifesaver. Like there's no way of underselling the graph. Everything I say is underselling it because what it did for developers is absolutely incredible. Like it allowed to have a GraphQL API that presents the state of the chain or the state of a contract and it allows you to run any custom math on it because anytime an event runs or a function is called, it allows you to update this API for you. So you basically get convert a, a smart contract into an API 
that is a GraphQL API. So uh, that will be the transition that you will do. So a Web2 developer, just learn ethers, talk to the chain directly, then add the graph as a way to uh, do faster loads and have more details. And then the third layer, which kind of segues into solidity development, is using smart contracts as backends. This is the most underexplored area of uh, Web2 to Web3 development, so front-end development, because the reality is that the GAF node, the, Go, the Ether Go node, is so powerful, so optimized, so well-written, that if you just write a smart contract that uh, queries all the data on chain and it sends this back to you in one query, you can get an insane amount of data for basically cheap at an incredibly, incredible speed, like an insane speed. Uh, and um, most people don't do that. Most uh, projects use, uh, you know, ethers to fetch data, super slow. They use the graph to fetch data, which is pretty good. Uh, but no, very few projects actually populate all their data through smart contracts, which I think is the next step in uh, front-end development. So I'm a little unclear on what you said there. Like, I, I thought that basically like the smart contract is running on Ethereum and that's what these libraries are going with direct. Like that's what happens normally. So how is that like one step better? Yeah. Okay. Before I can explain that, and I think this is kind of a more nuanced uh, take on uh, Web2 development, but ultimately what, what are you building when you're building a website? You're basically building some data that is sent from a server to the client, to a person right? That's what a website is, right? It's just some data that is sent from the ser from a server to you, yep. right? But then you have the problem of how much data do I send? Because if I send too much, and you, you probably remember with WordPress, when you put too many plugins, it loads super slow. It literally becomes unusable after a while. And so people start using what are called caches. And cache is just a way to store some data and uh, basically uh, make sure that it's it's already there instead of loading it again. But with uh, smart contracts, you need to query on uh, the chain when it's fresh. You can't fake that data. You got to load it fresh. So the naive approach will be to do what you will do on Etherscan, where you go on one address, you click one function, and you get back one piece of data, mm -hmm. right? And that maybe takes you one second to do with uh, JavaScript. And it's a metaphor. But basically, each request will take you, let's say, one second just to make it easy. And now, let's say you have 100 volts. On, on Badger, on the Badger website, you have a hundred of those items. Now you have to do those 100 second requests uh, together. And so it will take you a hundred seconds if you do it super naively. There is a JavaScript uh, tool that allows you, it's called uh, promise.all, but basically it allows you to query them all together. And so maybe it will take you five seconds to get those hundred requests, but it's still pretty slow. And so the next layer, the next solution will be to use an API. This is what uh, Jintao, one of our colleagues, will do, is they basically set up an API because that way the load data uh, is cached. It's already cached in uh, this server. And so you don't need to actually query the chain each time. You just query the chain when the data is not fresh, and then you send the data from the API to make uh, the next load faster. Uh, the problem with an API is that it's a lot of work to maintain. It's an incredibly massive amount of work. And so what uh, did the graph do? They basically build an API that automatically updates based on uh, smart contract changes. And so instead of querying the chain to make the load faster, just the load, we're not talking about writing to the chain, you still have to write to the chain directly, but to load and read and just to, to show data to people, you can actually use an API. And so the graph, that's what it does. And that's why the graph was in insane advancement. And I've been in, in this space when there was no graph, and I can assure you, people cannot appreciate the graph enough. It is an incredible tool. It's basically made it possible to have websites that don't completely suck. And then the third layer, though, the third layer is almost full circle. It's the fact that you understand that, that Ethereum is incredible. The node is a miracle. It's literally an achievement of human ingenuity. And so you can actually write a smart contract that calls to other smart contracts it gets all that data, it formats it for you so you get back like a nicely formatted object. And that, that way, instead of having to make 100 requests or having to have an entire set of infrastructure that you don't even manage, which is the graph, uh, to index all the stuff and then return an API, you basically just query the chain directly and it sends you back one response and it's the entire object that you need. And that's 
I will be a smart contract used as an API. And so it will be like a smart contract that can do nothing. It doesn't write. The only thing it does is it has a bunch of view functions to return some information off the chain back to you. And that's uh, um, extremely underexplored. Uh, but if you're looking for like, and this went from a basic uh, discussion to an advanced discussion, but if you're looking to squeeze uh, the maximum performance, that's what you got to do. And that's why as a front-end developer working on Ethereum or in Web3, you have to learn smart contract development because ultimately the best API is the one you don't write. The best API is a smart contract that does the entire work for you. All right. So I think that brings us to our next part, which is the getting started in Solidity. So what I, do you want to give us like a brief introduction to like what that is and how, how it, what it does within Ethereum? Are there any kind of like competing languages within Solidity or is that basically it for writing these, the, the smart contracts? Yeah, and um, there actually are. So but let's talk about uh, very briefly about what uh, Ethereum is and uh, how it works. Ultimately, Ethereum is a uh, virtual machine as in uh, it's literally like you can think of Ethereum literally as a computer that has registries, it has a stack, it has memory. It's literally the same thing as a actual computer. It's just, it's not, it's not tangible. It's a, a, a ephemeral, it's, it's in the ether. It's a, it's a virtual, it's literally doesn't exist on uh, physically, but it exists mentally and it exists programmatically. So uh, in order to uh, use a, any computer, uh, you need to compile its code. And so uh, compilation is the act of converting uh, data uh, or information instructions from something that a human can read, typically, uh, let's say C or assembly even, to something that a machine can read, which is uh, machine code. Uh, in the case of Ethereum, because the, uh, the, there is no real machine, uh, uh, the, the final compilation stage is called bytecode. And bytecode is just a, a bunch of hexadecimal numbers, where hexadecimal means it goes from 0 to 15, which is F. Uh, and it basically is just um, this code uh, that represents a set of machine instructions that the Ethereum virtual machine can execute. And so anytime you deploy a smart contract, you're basically paying the gas, and we have a different podcast on gas, but you're paying gas to store this bytecode at a certain location. The location is known as address and it's where the contract resides. And then the contents of the location are the bytecode as well as the storage, where storage is a um, way to permanently add um, um, information on chain. You basically, uh, that you pay for by, by the, the gas, you literally paid by the byte. Uh, but ultimately, that's what a smart contract is. It's just an address on the Ethereum machine with some bytecode that allows to run certain operation. And so if you think about it that way, uh, going back to the video we made about MetaMask and signing, when you sign a transaction, you see that your signature is converted to hexadecimal, right? You have the function selector. The reason why it gets changed to hexadecimal is because that exact signature, that exact selector, that exact hexadecimal combination is the one that is being found on the bytecode so that the, ma the virtual machine knows where to run the operation, okay? So that should give you an intuition for the fact that the entire Ethereum is just a bunch of uh, hexadecimal uh, that allows to run a set of instructions that are uh, arbitrary in the sense that a person made them, uh, but ultimately they're, they're the instructions that make this uh, virtual machine. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Uh, so. But getting back to like Solidity, so that is the, I mean, that's like the default uh, language that's used to program the smart contracts right. and what, what, like. Yeah, to get the bytecode, basically to get to the bytecode that is uh, something that no human can write, uh, maybe one person on earth can do it. But like uh, to get to the bytecode, we need to write in a language that we can understand as human beings. And so the currently most popular option is called Solidity. And it's a, a uh, Java-inspired language, I guess. Java or JavaScript-inspired language. It's just a. It has types. Uh, it has. A, it's a pretty, pretty. If you've written in Java, it's basically very similar to Java. And then uh, there is a competing language which is inspired by Python, which is called Viper. 
And Viper um, may actually be easiest for newbies. So if you're really getting started now, you may want to look at Viper. You're going to have less resources because it's less used, uh, but it's a pretty uh, easier language to get started with because it's basically Python with some twists. So it may be a, a also a great idea. Um, during this call, I'll talk about Solidity, but ultimately it may be worthwhile to at least try both. All right. So for someone that is, let's let's go back like we did with web, the web uh, front end stuff. So someone who has no coding experience um, or someone who's already, maybe they know JavaScript, like what, how, how would you recommend they get started in Solidity? So again, I would recommend having some intuition for these languages, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, but, but ultimately, like I've, I know people that didn't. So I know you can skip ahead and just go with uh, 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 Solidity immediately. And so the first thing you got to do when you start with Solidity is you have to understand that you are dangerous. It is what you're doing is really dangerous. You can, honestly, you can fuck up people's lives and you can fuck up your own life if you're not careful. So you basically have to really understand the risks and you have to basically not be uh, uh, too uh, brave or too, too brave. Uh, how do you say? Uh, you, you, you can't portray yourself as better than you are. Because people may trust you and you will fuck yourself and them over. Because again, this language is really, uh, it's not even that complex, but it has a lot of gotchas. And so things can go very wrong. And so uh, you just want to be really mindful of that. So how do you get started with Solidity? I mean, first of all, there are great resources. The first one will be the Ethereum website. You can go on the Ethereum website to find some starting resources. Another big one will be uh, the Open Zeppelin smart contracts. That's something you want to read. Um, some of your best learning uh, on Solidity at this time will be done by reverse engineering. You basically have to find something you like, and then you have to read their code. Uh, it's a lot more uh, difficult to find great tutorials, although I'll mention two. Uh, first one being Austin Griffith. Austin Griffith on YouTube. Basically, the most inspiring content you'll ever find is there. Anything that is cool about Ethereum, he covered. So go and check Austin Griffith. And then the second person is Patrick. Uh, let me check uh, his last name. It's Patrick. Uh, he also did a 16-hour video with um, Free Code Camp on how to get started with Ethereum. Absolutely. And uh, these are basically your uh, starting uh, uh, Patrick Collins. There it is. Patrick Collins. So honestly, I'm going to just chill a little bit. Uh, but uh, I think the Chainlink Hackathon is one of the best hackathons to learn because Patrick is an amazing teacher. So you should really check out Patrick's work. There's also two other hackathons I'll mention just uh, uh, so that you know what your first uh, kind of uh, scouting ground is going to be. Uh, the first one is Gitcoin. Gitcoin uh, basically uh, has a bunch of bounties. You can pick any bounty, work on it. And if your work is good enough, you'll get paid for it. So that's a great way to learn and be motivated. And then the second one is called If Global. If Global basically does more uh, structured hackathons where there's uh, lectures, lessons, and then uh, sponsor prizes. And uh, again, uh, monetary incentive can be a great way to motivate you to learn the technology. But ultimately, they are also great ways to just uh, uh, find people that can help you and teach you some of that stuff. Because ultimately, most of your best learning will be done uh, by yourself. The last resource I got for you, which is my favorite resource, I keep using it every day, basically. It's solidity-by-example.org. Solidity-by-example.org. That basically shows you examples of how to do basic stuff. How do I build a struct? How do I do an if-else? How do I save in memory? How do I save in storage? How do I write a function? That kind of basic things that allow you to... Um, uh, basically you kind of uh, uh, remember stuff because uh, if you if you're written in uh, multiple languages the issue is not the logic the issue is just sometimes you forget the syntax so if you need a quick primer on the syntax that's where you want to go and then I guess the last uh, um, resource that you truly want to study and I'm a massive fan of is rect.news uh, because ultimately in learning solidity you can uh, really wreck yourself and so you want to learn uh, by uh, going on Recto News on the leaderboard and seeing uh, what mistakes other developers made and learn from them.
uh, because ultimately every mistake you don't read about is a mistake you're going to make. So you may as well save yourself the trouble by learning. I, I was reading, I think on Twitter or somewhere, and, and there was a, someone had an interesting kind of like comparison. Um, like they, they said that basically like if you're learning Solidity, and this goes back to kind of your warning at the beginning, right? Like Solidity is basically a, a programming language, language for this digital money, digital scarce goods. And if you fuck up, you're losing people's funds, basically. Like if you're creating an app, right? And they said that like basically if you're learning this, you should think of it more like, you know, you're building a chip for a, an aircraft navigation or you're building some kind of like hardware that is people's lives are depending on it. Right. And it's very different than like coding a website where the web, you know, the worst thing that happens is the website goes down or something or, it, you know, you have restore it from the backup. Right. Because it's because of the blockchain, all the transactions are, you know, final immutable that it is really the stakes are that much higher or is it just that the stakes are higher or is it that the type of logic and type of operations that you're doing are just fundamentally different? I'd say it's both. You are um, uh, really uh, forced to think in a slightly different way than uh, some other programming languages because of how um, meta the conversation gets, because of the fact that you not only have functions, which is something that is present in any Turing, uh, um, I may be wrong, but like most languages have functions. It's really not a particularly complex idea. The fact that you can store a certain set of code that runs an operation given certain inputs and it just reliably does that. It's really not uh, nothing new. Uh, but the fact that this can happen during a transaction, which is atomical, which is in a block, which means it's sequential and there can be other transaction altering the state of the chain. And uh, in a way they can have side effects on your uh, transaction. Um, uh, that can be uh, problematic. The second fact is the fact that the state of the chain is uh, only known after settlement, which means that uh, you can sign a buy order for Uniswap. And uh, the price that you get quoted when you sign is different from the price that actually gets executed because, again, settlement happens after, happens when your transaction actually is run and mined. Uh, so that means that as a programmer, you need to be aware of the fact that space and time, in a way, are relative. They literally could be now or they could be in 10 seconds or they could be in 15 seconds and so uh and your transaction can happen before something else or after something else or in the middle or something else can happen 20 times and then your transaction can happen and so there's this different level of gotchas uh that you wouldn't uh necessarily be uh aware of and uh if you think about it like with ethereum we had some exploits that are insane we actually had chain breaking exploits and as in we literally hard forked ethereum uh, over those uh and uh, the dao being the first example like the dao caused a fork on ethereum because the dao had a re-entrancy vulnerability uh what is re-entrancy it just means that you can rerun the same operation multiple times and in doing so uh, the state doesn't actually update and uh, you basically can uh, move the same funds multiple times uh how hard is it to spot once you know what reentrancy is it's really not particularly hard there are tools that will literally tell you where every possible reentrancy can happen uh, but if you're not aware of them if you're misguided in uh, uh, naive and uh, uh, over ambitious in uh, uh, what you're building you can get wrecked in literally one line of code because again you there's the meta layer on top of your normal layer does that make sense? All right. So you've gone through these these resources. You're ready to kind of like do your first real project. Do you have some uh, kind of suggestions or um, or ideas for kind of like tackleable first things that, that someone could build? 100%. I'd say uh, the first thing would be to literally just write a smart contract as in, can you get anything to compile? As in, can you write contract name of contract curly braces and then put like a public variable in it can you do that and can you get it to compile perhaps you use remix or perhaps you want to immediately use a framework such as brownie foundry or uh, hard at any of those frameworks is great but basically you want to pick and you want to be aware of the options and then you want to pick one and build a basic contract such as that literally just write a function 
that allows you to change a variable in a contract and then write a function to retrieve the variable from the contract, as simple as it gets. And then once you can do that, your next step will be to write, for example, a ERC20 token, a normal token uh, we have on Ethereum, by um, reading about the standard, then going on Open Zeppelin and using the Open Zeppelin library. And then obviously you could go deeper by writing your own ERC20. And then you can do the same thing for a ERC721, uh, which will be an NFT. Perhaps you can build a factory for these NFTs, a way to mint more than one at a time. That could be really cool. Or a way to airdrop the NFTs, given a list of addresses, send those NFTs to people. And so now you went from, uh, uh, you wrote very basic code, but you already are dealing with actual real life use cases and actual uh, uh, primitives, things that we build on top of that are real and used in uh, production uh, today. Once you did that, my next advice would be to build a registry uh, a contract, something that gives you a list of data. It could be a list of tokens. It could be a list of addresses, etc., and use that as the back end for your front end. So that way you are building a, a little bit of a mixed, an actual real application because you're going from solidity to front end and you're building the entire thing. So you can show an example that we use in Badger would be a list of vaults. Show the vaults, allow to deposit, allow to withdraw, show the balance of the vaults, that kind of stuff. And then uh, a more basic version would be just a list of your tokens. Uh, perhaps uh, show a um, portfolio, just build a portfolio app that allows you to see, given your MetaMask and a list of tokens, what your balance is, something like that. And then the last uh, challenge that I would challenge you to would be to actually build a yield farming strategy. And uh, that would be like a more of an achievement uh, of your uh, uh, growth, because ultimately, in order to build a yield farming strategy, you need to understand how other people's code works. Let's say Aave, Compound, uh, or even our Badger vaults. You want to learn those. And then once you understand how they work, you code your own yield farming strategy to use the assets, earn yield, harvest it, and grow. And ultimately, you built a kind of a little bit of a small garden that can become kind of a self-sustaining um, uh, uh, perpetual machine that uses yield to uh, maintain itself. And so that's kind of the progression I recommend. Simple contract, ERC20, NFT, registry contract, yield farming strategy. And if you're interested in building yield farming strategy or if you're skilled enough to do that, we are actually going to be offering bounties on Gitcoin uh, which is going to happen in uh, two days on the 10th of March for Gitcoin round 14. We're going to be offering um, highly paying yield farming strategies, bounties. So if you can write a, a bounty for, uh, sorry, if you can write a strategy uh, that either does levered uh, Aave farming, levered Phantom, levered Geist, or a locking strategy where you lock tokens and earn more rewards, uh, there's going to be a great bounty awaiting for you. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more. So you mentioned the the resources earlier, but those were kind of like general solidity resources. Where, if someone is really wanting to like find examples of good yield farming contracts to build on, where or tutorials, do you have any ideas for that? Like someone particularly in this this niche, I'd say at this point, it's uh, um, it's just like when I got started. The best way to learn those uh, contracts is going to be that you go on a website. Let's say you go on Badger dot uh, com app.badger.com and you interact with one of the vaults and then in doing so you can get the address of the vault and then you can get the source code of the vault and you're going to have to read that code and figure out what the vault and the strategy do and that's going to be your best uh, the best way in which you can learn the code is really to find something you like it could be our work it could be Aave Compound there's many other there's DeFi Dollar there's Instadap uh, there's a million of them, and uh, you can just read their code and learn from it. Uh, we are at a point where uh, the, there's a few teachers, I've already mentioned them, uh, but everything, every meaningful learning to be done is going to be done autonomously, and you got to uh, really do it for yourself. Got it. So we've gone through all the Solidity stuff. Do you want to briefly talk a little bit uh, deeper about these Gitcoin bounties? So for someone who's gotten this far and is, is interested in... Um, Maybe they're a developer already, or or you know an advanced uh, person who's gone through these resources and they want to get to the bounties. Uh, um, 
where where should they go? What what should they look at? Who should, if they want to reach out to someone at Badger, who should they they contact? What's like the next step for for them in that in that uh, area? Amazing. And first of all, I'd say if you made it this far, uh, there's going to be a link uh, to Discord for the Dev Developer Discord. Make sure to join that. Make sure to join our Developer Discord. You can tag me, Alex the Entrepreneur, at any time relating to Gitcoin, and uh, we will also. Uh, accept custom bounties. So if you have a specific idea, just reach out. We most likely are interested at least in hearing your thoughts uh, and uh, we'll consider it and we can find uh, custom bounties. That said, uh, I'll also share how I basically got this job uh, as a kind of an inspirational tale. But ultimately, you just want to go on Gitcoin, gitcoin gitcoin.co.co and then you want to go in hackathons and you want to find Gitcoin Round 14 and then you want to filter by bounties and find Badger, Badger.finance. It's just going to be something like gitcoin.co slash hackathon slash uh, gr13 slash uh, Badger. Just uh, uh, click a couple buttons and you'll find our bounties. And uh, all of the bounties will have details. There's going to be links to the code. There's going to be links to um, uh, the resources. And I'm also going to upload uh, video tutorials or like a quick vi- uh, video discussion about the bounty where I'll talk about it. And lastly, again, you can join us on the uh, Discord uh, to further chat. The three bounties that I'm uh, currently working on, I'll uh, just briefly mention them. Uh, They're going to be very specific. The first one is the introductory bounty. This one we will offer at every hackathon. And it's the strategy bounty. Basically, we want you to build a yield farming strategy. This time, it's going to pay uh, $2,000 for any valid submission and up to uh, $8,000 if we end up using it. So it's more than the usual because it actually only has a list of valid submissions. So the valid strategies that we're interested in are going to be levered strategies where you go on a lending protocol and you lever up, which means you deposit on the protocol and then you borrow and then you redeposit and then you borrow, et cetera, to be uh, farming levered rewards. For the phantom chain, for the specific uh, protocols being Geist, Scream or Ave, those are the three protocols we're interested in. And then the other uh, bounty or the other vault we're, we're interested in is a locking vault. That means that you take a governance token, it could be 100 of finance, Solidly, Solidex, or any other uh, um, governance token that allows a locking. And then you farm rewards so that you can lock more. And then any reward that uh, you don't want to relock, you can emit through the Badger tree. And there's details about how uh, what that means. And I also talk about it in the video. But ultimately, you want to fork the uh, Vault's 1.5 mix. We basically have a mix that is already set up with unit test, with basic code, with all the stuff already there. All the instructions are there. Just read them over, set up the config, set up the strategy, customize the test, etc. cetera. And uh, once you go through that, your submission is valid as long as it compiles, it is profitable, and you wrote custom tests that are passing. Those are the requirements. If you're if it's profitable, it actually works. And the, uh, the tests are written and they pass, it's going to be a valid submission. So that's going to be $2,000. And then if we actually end up using it, we're going to give you an extra $3,000 uh, bonus. And lastly, if we truly de- deploy it on live, we'll give you a bonus $3,000 when it goes live. Uh, making a total of up to $8,000 in bounties, all paid in the Badger token. Uh, And lastly, we also uh, made it clear we have a DAO hiring policy, which means that if you successfully submit a bounty, uh, we will offer you a follow-up one-on-one bounty with the goal of hiring you uh, for long-term. So this is the basic starting bounty. Again, 5K basically if you do a great job. Uh, If you're you're a great developer, you're going to basically win up to uh, 8K, but most likely 3K or 5K. Uh, the other two bounties are more advanced. They're really complicated. And so they're only for truly advanced developers. Uh, one of them is called the Chadger Registry and Website Bounty. We want you to set up a combination of a uh, smart contract used uh, in conjunction with a website uh, that is fully, fully trustless, fully autonomous, meaning that the website doesn't require anything else except the MetaMask from the user and the smart contract on chain to populate its own data. And so the, we want you to build a smart contract called the Chadger registry, which is basically a, a, a registry that allows to deploy new vaults, 
So it needs to have a clones uh, functionality that clones a, a new vault uh, technology. And then it stores that address on the registry under the deployer, under the message the sender, the person that used it. And um, by doing so, it's going to populate a set of uh, fields for who uh, the strategist is and what they deployed so that then you can build a website that given those uh, data, that data would the strategists are, it will show them on the website. And then if I go on the single strategist page, if I click on the strategist, I want to go on a page that shows me all of the vault that that strategist deployed. So it basically will be the prime example of a smart contract registry with a front end uh, for it. And for this bounty, we're offering $15,000 um, in uh, paid in, um, or sorry, this is $20,000 paid in Badger. So this is basically our prime bounty for this uh, hackathon. If you want to test your skills and build a basic a product, this is where uh, you want to put your attention to. And the last bounty we got is the Badger on-chain guest list factory bounty. This one again is for the uh, Solidity developers, uh, only uh, true Solidity developers, advanced uh, developers only. Uh, it ultimately consists of building a factory that allows us to deploy a contract called uh, guest list, um, and it automatically fills uh, some of this, uh, some of its data uh, um, with a uh, additional functionality. That given a dollar amount, it automatically figures out what the underlying value of in dollar is, and it sets the guest list so that it will work and it would allow us to deploy it uh, in dollar amounts. So this is uh, um, basically a factory contract that deploys a new child contract called guest list that, uh, and it also pre-fills them through this mechanic of uh, finding price. Uh, and this one is a true advanced uh, uh, bounty. Uh, there's a bunch of links to work I've done in terms of calculating math and uh, the process we follow to set up the guest list. And so your job, if you want to pursue this bounty is to understand what we're truly trying to do and then build something uh, to compete with that. And uh, this bounty will be paid $15,000 for, the, for a valid submission that has the code that works, unit test that prove that it works, and integration tests that go through the full uh, cycle and show that it actually is a, a valid submission. Again, $15,000 paid in Badger token. And so this would be like for the launch of a new project when you're distributing tokens to the people that are on the guest list? So guest list is, uh, um, uh, we basically have an idea called guarded launches, which means that uh, we uh, launch a new vault, but we limit the deposits. In order to limit that, we need to use this guest list contract, uh, which uh, basically requires us to set up a separate script, deploy it, and then do four or five on-chain transaction. It's basically a massive uh, waste of time. And it also requires the math to be done in uh, underlying want, which could be you know, a random coin. And so uh, in um, this factory needs to address these two issues. One, make it super fast to deploy a new contract and set it up. And two, calculate the dollar value so that as the deployer, we just input, you know, $3 million. We just input the dollar value and the guest list automatically converts it to the underlying uh, price of the asset. Meaning that uh, we can have a monkey set up the guest list instead of having it be done by a, a set of developers and engineers that need to really figure out all the math. So it's trying to really solve that issue at the underlying level and uh, in do and do it so by fetching quotes uh, uh, from multiple sources so we can find a price for the asset and then using that price to uh, set up the guest list and deploy it and immediately return it and uh, basically it being configured all in one transaction instead of requiring five or six transactions, which end up being a massive waste of time. Got it. Okay, so I think at the start of this conversation, I was uh, I was ready to go. I was ready to, to learn Solidity. Now this this sounds like a lot of work. This sounds uh, very complicated. So let's go back. Like you know, you're you're someone who has uh, you know your your career as a software developer. Like what what are the you know? So if I if I'm ready to set out on this journey, what are like the the best kind of like tips or hacks that you've used when you're kind of digging into a new technology? Like what? I'd say that, uh, um, I mean, there's many, there's many tools that you can use to motivate yourself. I feel like with time, the best, I mean, the, the true best motivator is um, uh, something internal. It's uh, basically your curiosity. That's the best way to do it. So if you can't find that curiosity, I would advise you to try at least 
try and find it, pretend like you're actually interested and maybe you'll end up becoming interested in the field. So that will be the first step. Uh, and then the second step will be more of external motivators. Um, uh, one big one would be um, other people's uh, respect or being grateful. Uh, the second one would be just money. And the third one will be fear and uh, um, uh, jumping over the fence. That's like a, a self-help uh, terminology is you just throw the hat over the fence and now you're forced to go over. And so something you could do is you could find a little project. Maybe you have a friend that wants some help. Maybe you have a client that will give you, like I used to work for like 50 bucks and I'm not even joking. Like I, my first website, maybe I sold, yeah, I probably did it for free, but like 50 bucks wouldn't be impossible for me. Maybe a, my, my price range would be like $150, $200 for my first website. That's what I used to do. And now if I were to charge a website, I would charge 10K. I wouldn't even talk to the person if they're not willing to give me 10K. How do you do that? Uh, you just start small. That's the reality. You just start really small and you uh, find the passion in doing it. Uh, with time, uh, you can have this creative uh, um, situation where you think about something and because you have cultivated the skill, now you can actually pursue it. While if you never cultivated the skill, you will never be able to pursue some of these uh, uh, technical uh, stuff. You will basically rely on somebody else. And sometimes... Um, you just got to do the work yourself. So I feel like if you can get in a situation where you're forced to do it, you will learn 100%. And in my case, it was perhaps by uh, a mixture of uh, uh, helping friends, even working for free. And then uh, maybe when I started freelancing, I would uh, uh, always try to find a job where some of the learning uh, I had to do on the job and so basically, I always found a way for the client to pay me for my learning or for me to motivate, you know, working a 12 hour day so that I could learn and build something cool, because ultimately it's also part of uh, what motivates me, just my passions in general. So in general, I feel like the passion will grow if you get uh, feedback, positive feedback. Uh, but at the same time, it's just a matter of being super nice to yourself and taking one step at a time. Uh, the first thing I mentioned is, can you even write a contract that even compiles? That's all you got to do. You just got to close your eyes, realize that there are 20 million other things you will have to do in the future. You just close your eyes and do that one. And once that's done, then you ask yourself what's next. So in a way, you got to really have blinders on to the fact that, yes, maybe you're not uh, at the ideal spot now. You're not the best in the world yet, you know, but one day you can. You can really become uh, incredibly good at this. It's just a matter of cultivating it step by step. So yeah, be nice to yourself and just try your best and uh, follow the path. The path is really laid out. Build contracts that increasingly become more complex and be nice to yourself every step of the way and you can do it. I remember I, I had a turning point. So like in, in a, my previous life, I um, was, was learning Arabic, right? And I got really good at Arabic. And if I don't know if you know, like for, for English speakers, it's like one of the hardest languages to learn. And I remember this time when I was uh, like studying in Morocco and I'd been like studying Arabic for years, maybe two or two years at that point. And like, there's just a very steep learning curve because the dialect that people actually speak is very different than what you get taught if you are in school learning at a university or something. And mm -hmm. I just remember the first time that I was able to have a conversation with someone and actually like help another person. Like I was talking to someone and, and she had a question for me and it was like something I could go look up online. And I like looked it up and then told her in Arabic and it helped her. And that was like, I was like, wow, like this is the first time that it's actually been useful to another human being. And I think like, Look, looking at like some stuff I've played around with with Solidity is like, you know, deploy, deploying a token um, is you can do that in like four lines of code, right? Like you're saying, like I was looking at Remix, like, you know, an ER, CR, ERC20 token is like four lines of code or whatever. And there is like, you know, these very advanced things, but like deploying a token, deploying an NFT, these are things that are very, very basic to do. And there are tutorials that I've seen, you know, that are like half an hour YouTube video that show you how to launch a token or do, do an NFT. And, and these are things that there's a huge demand for right now, right? Like, you know, sure, we're, we're going to build the Warcraft game, but like there's a huge demand for, uh, you know, 
monkey NFT picture profile pics still, right? Like there's all these things. Um, there are ways to be useful in this space that are very, not, not that big of a lift. I think that kind of like circles back to what you're saying, right? Like there are ways that you can be useful without getting to level 20. Yeah. And uh, something I found because uh, um, later in uh, my career as a freelancer, consultant, whatever, um, I started just teaching uh, more. Uh, and I ended up uh, uh, teaching two people that became consultants and freelancers. So it's like it's the meta job of teaching people how to get a job by themselves. And the biggest thing uh, that I saw that really holds people back is they either not do it for real. That's something that happens a lot. You think you are like doing the rep at the gym, but you're not even going deep enough. You know, when you do like push ups, you're not going deep enough. So that's one. And the same thing for work is like people just don't ask for anything. Like you send a job application and you don't ask for anything in return, like lack of a clear call to action, which means that people don't understand what the next step is, which means that people don't reply and you basically fail because you're not trying hard enough. That's one. And then the other side is literally the uh, the, the refund. That's the biggest thing I found for, for, for freelancers is the refund. Like a refund means that you can always give money back. Like you, you literally, I, I really believe in the fact that you don't have to be like an unethical uh, thief and run away with people's money. You can just build something, try your best, make an honest quote, like a, ask for, for a fair day of work. Let's say you're going to build an NFT. For a fair day of work, what are you willing to be paid? Whatever you're comfortable with. Some people are comfortable with 50 bucks, some with 500, some with 5,000, whatever the number that requires your brain to even open up is, you ask for that. And then you do your job, and if you fail, you just refund immediately. You ask, you say sorry, and you refund. And when you do that, that's what I found. When people really understand that, uh, they just start uh, finding more jobs because now the worst case scenario is that the client is not good for them because the client, uh, you know, has too many demands, doesn't pay enough, whatever. And so you skew the dynamic of you having to prove yourself to the client being the right fit for you where it's a win-win deal. And if it's not a win-win, you just back off and you refund uh, whatever work you were doing and you just go next because it's a waste of time to negotiate and whatever. Just give them the full money back and go somewhere else. And so if you can do that, you can start selling an NFT tomorrow, honestly. Just do the tutorial, see if that's what they want and whatever they value it, sell it. Uh, uh, ultimately, uh, all uh, commerce is uh, information arbitrage. Uh, because or it's just people not willing to put in the work like uh, um, some people find it better to just spend money than to actually do the work because maybe they're they're doing something more important sometimes the, the big decision of launching the project is more important than actually doing the work and so there are a million ways for you to get started and uh, find uh, uh, your place your a position that works for you and that people respect and they want to interact with you and once you're on uh, once you're playing the game uh, you 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 kind of uh, can can do whatever you can go big, or you can just uh, go for your ambition. Some people want to you know make a lot of money. Some people want to find purpose. Some people just want to be engaged. I feel like that's what this space gives you. It's the engagement, and then the the twist of whether it's the money, the culture, the knowledge, the political, the freedom, the the human activism, or whatever, whichever side you want to take, whichever twist uh, you can do. You can really um, make this uh, 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 an amazing opportunity because it truly is because of the, the noise around it. That's why it's there. the opportunity it comes with the volatility. They are the same thing. And then in going through the volatility, in being nice to yourself, in having those uh, small goals and achieving them day by day, you look back uh, six months and you're going to be somebody else. You literally will not uh, recognize yourself. And then uh, you you can uh, you can then ask yourself whether it was a good idea or not, and you you may have a different opinion, but ultimately at least you gave it a real shot. And so that's my biggest uh, hope for people that made it this far is to just give it a shot and just uh, have form a real opinion that is based on what actually happened instead of speculating. So just go try it, see if it works for you. You can do the tutorial on a weekend, and then uh, you can do the next tutorial in the next weekend, and then you read a little bit of Rect. And maybe, who knows, maybe that you actually are passionate about this. And uh, once you are, we have plenty of bounties to reward your uh, need for extrinsic uh, motivation. 
we will keep you motivated as long as you are interested in this space. Well, there you have it. So I think, you know, like with, with this podcast, I've been trying to get more uh, bits of alpha in crypto Twitter. There's always this give me, give me alpha. What token should I buy today? What's going to go up tomorrow? The real alpha and I think uh, if you've made it this far, the real alpha is investing in yourself, learning new skills. I think I've never been disappointed when I've taken time to, you know, bang my head against trying to learn a bit of solidity or recording like the deep stuff that that you and I have done about uh, get, getting under the hood of a, of a single transaction, right? Those are the kind of things that are the, you know, you, you really can't lose, right? Either you learn something that uh, enables you to go deeper in the career, develop deeper conviction in the space, learn um, beyond the surface bullshit of, you know, buy this token today, buy this token tomorrow. Um, that's that's really like in my life, the things that I found most rewarding. And, um, you know, if we only get 10 people that listen to this podcast because we spent all this time, you know, doing a bunch of uh, nerdy shit about, about coding, I think I'm happy with that because if we get one of those 10 that apply to this bounty that, um, you know, change their life, get a job working in crypto, I think that's a win. Yeah, I'd like to close by saying that I, I truly believe that most people want you to succeed. Like nobody gives a shit about you in the sense that nobody will take the time to do the work for you or to help you unless you ask. Uh, but when you do ask, there's very few people that given the right context would uh, deny helping somebody else. Like uh, uh, if you message me two lines and you ask me for a job, I'm not even going to reply to you. If you send me a message that you failed to compile a contract because you didn't try, I'm just going to tell you to fuck off because you are wasting my time because you didn't try enough. But if you are trying hard and I can tell because you spent a day trying to compile the thing and it doesn't work, uh, I can help you. I will help you. And if you try hard enough and you try to solve uh, the stuff or you want to launch your own company and you reach out to um, the founders, they're going to help you as well because they basically, we all see uh, ourselves in each other and we can share that experience. And so if you did take the journey, which I think is a very meaningful journey and can be made uh, through into building Trump, so, uh, you can really build something truly beautiful in this journey and you can actually give a, give a little bit of your talent uh, to something that uh, is going to be more worthwhile than, you know, selling ads or something like that. Uh, I, tr I truly think it, it is wor a worthwhile endeavor. And so ultimately the people that agree with me, uh, or if you are a person that agrees with me, um, we're going to have a great time um, chatting and we're, we're going to know. Like, um, so you, in a way, in pursuing your passion at the highest level, you find that you're not truly alone uh, on this world because there are few people that share that, and um, and they can um, they can um, uh, you know they can uh, hang out with each other and they can make it uh, an amazing experience. So I truly hope uh, you're gonna take the journey. Check out our bounties. There's gonna be a link. Check out our Discord. There's gonna be a link as well. Go ahead with the resources, go learn, and who knows, maybe we'll we'll see you in the metaverse. All right, we'll see you in the metaverse. Cheers. You have an amazing one. Take care.